Hey guys, welcome to Hipfuse History. Bang, bang for the learning. Now I'm gonna change that to choo-choo for the learning this time, because we're gonna take a look at kind of the big ideas surrounding the Transcontinental Railroad, which was built from 1863 to 1869. So certainly if you're in a United States history course and you know nothing about the Transcontinental Railroad, um, when it comes to the final exam, you better stay home, so. <laughs> All right, context, guys. Before the railroad was built, and we're talking about, you know, like 1820s, 1830s, in terms of traveling across the United States and getting on a wagon and moving to Cali, uh, that's not a good idea. We're talking about two, three months travel, trepidatious travel. You're going through mountains and there's Native Americans and there's probably some bad, bad men, let's just put it that way, that are gonna try and stop you. Or if you are a millionaire, you certainly can get on a boat and get all your stuff and go around Cape Horn in South America but that's probably a month on a boat and that's a pain in the butt as well. So really that's the big idea is that we're going to quickly accelerate that travel to about a week for under $100. That's a huge, huge deal. Um, in terms of mileage, we're talking about 1,907 miles that was eventually built by three different entities, the Western Pacific, the Central Pacific, and the Union Pacific. The Central Pacific is gonna do the hardest work. That's gonna be through the mountains. Um, and the Union Pacific is really having the easier work. They're coming through the Plain States and they're gonna meet in 1869 on May 10th at Promontory, I might mispronounce that, Promontory? Utah, Utah, baby, where they're gonna drive in the last gold stake in this huge ceremony that's gonna really be symbolic of the railroad being complete. So let's take a look at some big ideas in terms of economics, in terms of labor, and labor, labor, and then we're gonna see how it affects the United States. So I think that the economy is the most important thing, and not so much the effects, but how it's built. You're taught that the United States is operating during the Industrial Age under a blanket that's called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, hands off. And that's kind of true when we're talking about regulation of industry. There is really no big regulation of industry. There's no child labor laws, there's no work safety laws. It's really kind of, you know, every man for himself out there. Um, so when we're talking about how the railroad's built, it isn't hands off. It's a theory of government called economic nationalism using subsidies. Subsidies, children, that's the word of the day, which basically means that the government is going to inflate uh, corporations with the ability to build this railroad by doing certain things. So what are they doing? So for instance, in 1862, Congress passes the Pacific Railroad Act, which is basically going to create a financial uh, formula, which is going to reward companies for every mile of railroad track that they build. And they're also gonna eventually be giving out land grants to these railroad companies as they build them that are gonna include not only a 400 foot right of corridor, but 10 miles of land. Um, in different sectors on either side of the tracks that the railroad companies are going to be able to sell to raise revenue. But without government intervention, who knows that the railroad was going to be built. But certainly, if you're talking about laissez-faire, this isn't laissez-faire. This is government intervention, but on the side of big business and rewarding some corporations over others. And that's maybe an unfair advantage, and it's truly not fair competition. But certainly... It's really important, I think, that we understand that not only the subsidies to railroad companies, we also have the Homestead Act that's passed in 1862, which is a huge incentive for settlers to move out west to start populating these towns that are gonna run these railroads and basically to give you know, kind of a shot of uh, steroids to Manifest Destiny to get this big boy done. Okay, that's probably enough for the economy, but economic nationalism is this theory. Subsidies is a really important word, and certainly balancing that with the theory of laissez-faire, of hands-off government and maybe uh, this really not being a an example of laissez-faire but rather government intrusion in the economy, son. Every test I've ever taken or given has something in terms of immigration and labor dealing with how the railroad is built. So basically the two different railroads, you have the Central Pacific, which built about 690 miles through the mountains, and they're basically gonna get about 10,000 Chinese immigrants to do all of that labor for about a dollar a day under very harsh conditions. Literally like climbing up the mountain and sticking a piece of dynamite in it and lighting it and getting Oops. 
I mean, that's the kind of work that we're talking. And that's going to be a huge idea in terms of effects because there's going to be xenophobia and a kind of a nativistic kind of attitude that operates around these Chinese immigrants. We're not going to accept them wholeheartedly, let's put it that way. And certainly there's a different kind of population that's building the railroad on the Plain States, and this is the Union Pacific, which built about uh, 1,085 uh, miles of track, something like that. But this is mainly Irish immigrants. Remember, you have that potato famine that um, kind of occurred you know, a decade before. You also have German immigrants, you have uh, freed slaves and runaway slaves during the Civil War years, and certainly a lot of ex-Confederate and Union soldiers that have a lot of experience with railroads because railroads were really important in the Civil War. But those two labor bases are going to build this railroad. And remember, there's no unions, there's no government regulation, there's no minimum wage, so it's very dangerous work. And if they want to fire you because they don't like how you look, you're fired. Get out of here. All right, let's take a look at some other ideas. I'm so excited. All right, so I guess we'll finish up with some really, really big ideas. Um, in terms of questions, you really should know that the railroad really is starting in Omaha, Nebraska, just west of the Mississippi and the Missouri River, and it's being completed over to San Francisco. Those are kind of the two different centralized locations. In terms of big effects, you have standardized time zones that develop in terms to make sure that the trains are going to be on time. You have telegraph lines and later telephone lines that are going to be built in correspondence with those railroad lines because the railroad companies wanted to be able to communicate. But those communication lines are going to be critically important to developing mass communication across the United States. I think another big idea is kind of the Chinese that worked on that Central Pacific and what's going to occur to them really with a rash of nativism and xenophobia. There's some vocab for you right there on the wall. How about that, kids? That's really going to create pressure on Congress to take action, resulting in the 1880s with the Chinese exclusion. Act, which is a very blatant kind of anti-immigration law that was passed as a result of that Chinese experience. And I think the biggest idea is that this is really kind of symbolically not only kind of this union idea that after the Civil War, you know, we're coming together as the country and we're building something great and this is going to unite the United States, but physically it's going to unite it. This kind of physically completes manifest destiny. And of course, the easy answers on the exam, cheaper goods, right? Cheaper communication, cheaper travel, and more population going out west creating more of a national economy. That's economic nationalism! And I think the last effect is going to be on um, the farmer population. Railroads are going to have a humongous effect on farmers' lives and being able to monopolize as railroads are and control transport prices on farmers, farmers are going to have to wake up and start to realize that they're going to have to unite. And that's going to result eventually in the Grange, which is going to put pressure on the government to pass laws like the Hepburn Act, which is going to regulate prices on the railroad. So those are really, really big ideas. All right, giddy up for the learning, guys. If you're not subscribed to Hip Use History, I don't even know how to look at the camera at you anymore. So make sure you press the big red button and you fly through the internet to subscribe to Hip Use History. So just some fun and free and funky lectures. That would just be grand. And certainly we'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons. Where attention goes, energy flows.